This is the first steam loco I made based on a roundhouse Lady Anne. The buffers were sprung white metal castings made by a company called Gratec or Greatec, and I don't think they make them anymore. The second engine I made was Peggy by Wright Scale. The buffers I made for her swing from side to side but are solid, so that when a coach or a wagon hits them, it makes rather a loud clatter and they're a bit unforgiving. My next designer buffer I made for Blanche, a DJB engineering loco. They're sprung loaded and they swivel about a pivot and work quite well. I'm going to use the same design for Russell and I'll show you how I made them. I have the rare buffer already fitted here and um, you can see how tight it is against the side control block on the rear here. I had to squeeze it in. I had to put it in a position. I had to put it into a position where it threaded to this piece of uh, brass angle at the back here. So this is my method of making a, um, a sprung loaded buffer from raw materials. You can see it there. You can see the hook for putting the chain onto and you can see it's spring loaded. In the front here it's much more a standard position. You can see the pin there and you can see the slot and that's where the shank's going to lie of the buffer. So it gives me a bit more length than it did here at the back because I've got more clearance at the front from the um, the front bogey and you can see that when I place the front bogey in and you can see that that pin there is clear. The main part is the shank and this is made from 3 sixteenths tubing, square tubing from K&S Metals and I take a piece of 532s which will fit into, slide into the 3 sixteenths and make a smooth telescopic joint as you can see here and that's going to become the spring loaded part of the buffers but first off it has to fit through the front here of the buffer beam and connect back to the pivot and I'll show you how I do that. I do that in a very simple way I just take a hammer or a vise and I squeeze the end of this until it's flat I've annealed the end of the brass here, that's heating it up until it's cherry red and then cooling it in water. I then put it in the vise like this. In the vise about um, three eighths of an inch and then I squeeze it until I get a flat, just like that. Now that's where my shank's going to go through. And also it's going to be the spot where the internal spring is held. Now to make it a little bit more amenable to the job I wanted to do, I've actually flattened it a little bit more so it's level with the bottom edge here as you see. It's just for the positioning on the pin and the slot in the front buffer beam. So now I'm going to drill a hole in here which is going to be the pivot point. First I'm going to drill through it with a 16th diameter drill. Then the next size is a number 34 drill, which is the tapping size for 4BA. essential things to do when you're doing engineering like this is to get rid of this burr that's been left on since the uh, drilling and I do that by using a larger size drill and I just wind off the burr 
on both sides, which is true for any. If you do any cutting job on metal, there will be some kind of a burr, whether it's filing or using the lathing, lathe tool. And it's just a really neat thing to do is to get rid of any of that sort of raised piece of metal and making the job smooth. Now I've got the piece of metal, holes in it, pass it through the buffer beam. Buffer beam's loose at the moment and try and get it on the pin. And you know what? I've made a big mistake. I, uh, I, I drilled it tapping size and it should actually be clearance size. I wonder if any of you noticed that mistake. Anyway, back to the drill and I'll make that hole bigger. Now I've got the hole the right diameter. We'll try and fit it. There we go. It's gone through the buffer beam. It's a nice fit. So what I'm going to do now is determine the length of this, because remember there's a shank to go inside of it, which is uh, this piece. I've got to put a pin through here to retain this from the spring, so allowing it to go backwards and forwards, and also give it something like the prototypical length. And if I, if I look at the drawings here, You can see the buffer beams on a sort of uh, extension, and that's the end of the buffer. And if I use a rule to measure it, we're talking in terms of seven eighths, seven eighths to the end of the buffer from protruding from the buffer beam. So I'm going to kind of work to that. I'm just going to work to that seven eighths coming out of here. The other end, I think, I did it without thinking, but I think. I'm pretty close. It's actually just um, it's just on three quarters of an inch. So I'll keep the um, the other. I'll keep the front at three quarters of an inch so that it balances the back end. Now most of the components of the buffers have been made. Um, the shank fits into the other shank, whatever it's called, the plungy bit, and this is um, held together with a split pin through here, which if you notice has a slot here. Don't worry about that other hole, that other hole was a miss was a misdrilled hole. It's this slot here. These two go together. The split pin goes through. And now I've got you see it's um it's actually workable. You can see it there more clearly. Slots backwards and forwards. Now all I need to do is, once I take the split pin out, is to put a spring down here. But before I do that, I've made a little plunger, or a little button I should say, which I'm now going to place inside here and lock it back. So the spring, although the spring could sort of fit up against the end here, it's nicer if it fits against a nice flat surface, which this button creates when I push it down through the buffer piece and then there's less chance of the spring binding. Now you can see the button there, it's in there and now I'm going to push it down all the way down inside as far as I can, as far as it can go. Right, the button's already gone down. I've used a little bit of a, um, a bar and hammered it down inside so it's really deep down inside of there. What's cool about doing this is that it uh, slightly widens the um, this brass square tube so the spring will go down it even more neatly than if I hadn't done that. I've got the spring now comfortably inside the, um, the shank. As you can see, the, um, if I put it the right way around, the holes line up there for the split pin to go through and the spring's got enough movement to make it springy. So if I put the split pin in, I had to do it by the side of the bench, but you see the split pin's now in. The spring is working. And all I need to do is to put the, um, the hook into the hole here, like so, and then put the, uh, the uh, buffer face on. Put the buffer face on like that. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to silver solder these three pieces together, take the split pin back out. Whoa! Thank goodness that didn't go onto the floor. You see it sprang right out of there. 
Now I've cleaned up these parts in the acid pickle and they're ready for putting together with silver solder. So what I have to do as you see here is attach the face of the buffer at right angles onto the buffer shank. I use uh, soft wire kind of stuff you might use in the garden for uh, tying plants up and I'm going to thread it through this hole here you need plenty of wire for this job going to place it the right way round it's always a good idea so I've wired it together I've eyeballed it so I've made sure that it's coming out right angles to the plate here I've also made sure it's in the center this way and that's going to hold together while I braise it then I insert that through there and then I'm going to braise the whole thing up together I'm just going to use a small plumber's propane torch because I don't need a huge amount of heat and uh, let's go just carefully slowly heat it up keep the heat down at the bottom where the um, brass is thicker. Heat the end of the um, silver solder up, dip it into the flux, get some flux on it. Get a little bit more flux on it. Coming around to do the top of that pin. And that's the job done. There are the pieces soldered together. It's uh, come out nice and square. Take the wire off giving it another quick dip into the um, pickle bath, clean it up a bit. So let's assemble this. Uh, that goes into there. Wrong way around, goes in that way. Split pin. Goes through there. Get a little closer, coming together quite nicely. This hook on the top is for a chain which goes between all the couplings. It's a kind of standard 16mm setup there. Okay, let's uh, assemble this and see how it looks. So this goes on this way. I'll get it there. This assembles in here. Like that. And then I put the pin through there we go, got that in there, got this onto the pin, get a nut, tighten that down, buffer booms are only temporarily fitted, and there we have the front buffer beam, all good and sound. So another part finished on the list. Here's my list of things to do. To finish the engine, I always make a list when I'm getting close to the end. And I can strike off buffers at the bottom there. So what I have left to do is um, complete the axle pump, which is, re is seating the balls and, and um, putting in uh, the seals, etc. on it. I've got to make a grate. I've finished the cladding. That's uh, over here. It's the planning member, you saw me making parts of this quite recently. So that's the whole cladding complete, and also the insulation underneath is complete in it as well. I've just got to put the bands around it and assemble it around the boiler, and whether I paint it first or not, I've got to make that decision. So, great, I said the cladding's done. 
Uh, got the radio control battery and receiver to fit. Got the whistle to make and fit. And I got the cab steps, one on either side to fit. And that's it, that's the engine. There'll be one or two other little jobs, I'm sure, but axle pump, great. Radio control, whistle and cab steps.